Howdy, y'all. Joe Hills here, recording as I always do in Nashville, Tennessee. And today on the Hermitcraft server, B00100 seems to be playing a little bit of the social angle in Demise. He's written a series of signs here, obviously inspired by the show The Walking Dead. To any reaper that wants to kill me, if you let me live, I will reward you with... Put your name below if you consent. A share of the prize! And so far, it looks like it's just Gem and Scar here. So let's see, can I actually sign this? A tree grew in the amount of time it took me to figure out if I could sign this. That's how long this is. This is a very delicate... I got a fishing rod, though. I'm sure I can write real well if I just focus. There it is. Gem, Scar, Joe Hills. Done. I might not be guaranteed the prize of Demise, but maybe I'll get a quarter of it. That sounds pretty good. But you know what? For all you Walking Dead fans out there, there's something else we can do real quick. On the back side of the signs, somebody else wrote, the back side of the sign was blank, but now there's this. And then they wrote, you know, that. So anyway, real quick, real quick. There we go. Don't dead, open inside. <laughs> I better be off to go and start surveying my community area. Luckily, my friend Quinn Murphy, tabletop role-playing game designer extraordinaire, is calling in for this episode while I get all that laid out. Let's go ahead and see what Quinn has to say. Time skip. We've got... Quinn joining us. Quinn is a fantastically talented tabletop role-playing game designer, which some people abbreviate as TTRPG designer, or some people just say game designer, because what is a game but a collapse of multiple concepts into one shared space? Let's go ahead and welcome Quinn to the show. Howdy, Quinn! Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm so glad to have you, Quinn. I have a pretty big project I'm working on. It's about 1,500 blocks by 1,500 blocks here in Minecraft, which oh, wow. it comes out to about a kilometer and a half by a kilometer and a half. So I always appreciate when I've got a lot of chores to do or something around the house to have you know somebody on the phone to talk to. I thought, like, why not have Quinn come on and uh, keep me company while I do some surveying? I got to go past where all my friends live here to the fringes of the Hermitcraft server to build a new community area. But you nice. know what? I'm not the only one building things that are about community. I hear community is in the name of your latest game. Uh, what can you tell me about community radio? Hey, um, community radio is, uh, I like to say, it's a, 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 a game, a, a role-playing game about a strange, strange place and the public radio station that supports it. It's um, influenced by things like um, uh, Welcome to Night Vale, uh, Northern Exposure, uh, Pontypool, like anything where there's something weird, maybe sinister going on, um, mm -hmm. but maybe also kind of funny uh, going on. Um, you can sort of play out with community radio. And so the, the basic game loop, if I understand it correctly, is that mm -hmm. the players would kind of act out scenes from this kind of creepy, isolated town, and then the game master would serve as like a radio host who kind of puts the uh, kind of, what, what is the spin on how that went down type of thing? Right. Before you start, um, everybody sort of contributes sort of elements uh, to make up um, the town, you know, what are some terrifying things in the town? What are some uh, weird things? What are some strange items? Uh, what are uh, innocent people who got caught up in them? You make a list of all these things. And then we have, uh, when you do the slice of life scenes, you basically pull from those elements. And it's it's almost kind of like a Mad Lib. There are different, like, uh, random scene frames mm -hmm. that you use um, and then plug stuff into it. Um, uh, plug like one of the elements in or one or two of the elements in, and then people will, uh, act that out. Uh, you don't have to do the full scene. It's usually sort of time. So you just, you don't have to like finish it, um, or, or worry about kind of, um, completing it. Cause that, that, that can be hard in, in sort of, uh, improv to go. Yeah. Uh, but, but at the end of that time, uh, then you sort of hand it over to the person in the host situation and then they sort of take that um, and then they have their own uh, kind of things that they might roll for um, and then they will uh, 
talk about it on public, you know, uh, talk on public radio. They might also be, you know, doing an ad um, for uh, something and or talking about the weather. And then they'll talk about that strange thing that happened, um, you know, outside the cemetery uh, that you just acted out in mm -hmm. uh, the previous scene. And then they will also um, read a decree from the secret city council. Um, and uh, the joke here is that every other player uh, besides the host is on the city council and they, uh -huh. uh, give, they give decrees um, uh, after each scene um, in secret and then they pass and then he picks one at random. And then, you know, he might announce like, oh, hey, like, you know, the city, the city council decrees um, that everybody like must, you know, tie a pint of blood. Or, or something, you know, or something, blood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, each day uh, un until morale improves, right? And, you know, uh -huh. and, and, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's an excuse for all the players to then uh, further get things crazy by making these uh, wild decrees from the city council. I'm not sure how quickly blood replenishes, but I, it feels like that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, you know, uh, so, some sometimes the the city council is allowed to be uh, as reasonable or unreasonable uh, as they want in the game. Um, it tends to be more fun when they are unreasonable. <laughs> well, I, I love that the city council that's like throwing in these new spins is the players. Mm -hmm. So this is a mm -hmm. pretty stark contrast. A lot of folks might be more familiar with like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, mm -hmm. where you have a dungeon master who kind of runs the show in terms of the setting and the background mm -hmm. of the story but here it sounds like everybody kind of gets together to collaborate on creating right. that initial setup yeah it's a it's a uh, sort of collaborative thing that the host is the gm but they are more of a facilitator mm -hmm. um and they're just sort of there to uh keep things moving and um sort of interpret uh play as it happens um yeah it's it's, it's a lot more about that uh the things that emerge from it and and it's uh, also tends to be different because there's no prep that really happens other than once you make the world um together in the session um you just get to it and there's not a uh whatever plot comes out um is just sort of what emerges mm -hmm. um so you can just uh it's a perfect game for hey uh not all of our players showed up uh let's play something with the people that we have here uh without having to prep something new you can just start playing immediately yeah and it seems like uh you were publishing this game in the zine format uh i saw on the kickstarter could you give the the viewers a little bit of an explanation of like what a zine is a zine is you know basically uh rather than a big hardcover um tome it's a you know short small um you know, uh, it won't, uh, it won't be more than, um, 50, 60 pages mm -hmm. say, um, and then it'll be, um, I think, I think we're going to do it perfect bound. Um, you know, but you know, a zine could be just staple bound kind of uh, thing. They're, they're small, uh, light portable affairs, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of the typical RPG, uh, big tome, uh, that we've, we've come to accept. And there's, there's nothing wrong with either format, but that's, you know, sometimes, you know, you want big games and you want light games and this is, uh, one of the light games. Yeah, I've seen at like uh, comics conventions and stuff. A lot of people will self-publish zines of their art and things like that. Like mm -hmm. it's it's just a, a more it, it's a a quick and easy thing to just slip into your bag. You know, something right. you can carry with you. It's not it doesn't feel like a textbook. You know, right? Exactly. And so people who are intimidated by the idea of learning how to play role playing games might look at something like that and go, "Oh wow, that's." Just a little thing. I could read that. I could play that game. You know, it's it's more approachable, I think, in some ways. Right. Yeah. W w one of the things when I made community radio is I wanted to make it sort of more of a uh, a party game, um, and so you can. Um, it's the kind of thing that you can get the feel of role playing without necessarily some of the um, accessory that we expect right there's no there's no character sheets here mm -hmm. um we use dice but we just use dice to generate random things that are happening um there aren't uh complex um rules to dictate what happened it's all kind of you make it up it's very similar to um something like a fiasco or ghost court if people have played it those are both great games um you know and, the, and the, those are games that you can just sort of uh, again just sort of pick up uh play and you get the feel of uh, role playing, you're definitely being other characters. You're definitely imagining other circumstances, um, but you're not doing it through the filter of 
uh, rules. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong. I, I also like I, I am a I, I do design for larger games like I uh, have written um, several books for Pathfinder um, and, uh, you know, have uh, written for D&D and other more complex games. I like those games in the space, too. Um, and But they're doing something very different um, than what the sort of lighter games do. And I think I think it's a good I, I like the ability to go back and forth between the two. Oh, that makes sense to me. Oh, well, and so one difference, you said there's no character sheets. I got the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that players don't necessarily play the same character every scene. Like, correct. You might have a scene at the gas station, and then you have a scene at the library, and then you have a scene at the city hall, and it might be like, okay, so who wants to play the notary? Who wants to play the gas station attendant who wants to play whatever, you know? Correct. And people just kind of jump in and they get to experiment with different roles. Yes. And they mm-hmm. don't have the commitment of like, oh man, I got to figure out how to stat out a wizard. I got to figure out which spells to take. I got to do all this stuff. So it's, it's a lot more kind of quick and easy to just jump into a role. And if you don't like that role, if you're like, oh, the voice I did for that wasn't what I wanted to do. You're like, you know what? That's okay. Next scene, you can be somebody else. But if you love a character, maybe you find a justification for, you know, bringing them back in another future scene, you know? Right, exactly. Um, and then actually, actually, that's a good segue. One of the things that we're adding in the second edition. So the first edition, it was just sort of like, hey, make a scene frame. And then and then it's just for you as a group to decide, you know, who's coming back or, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, in the... Uh, 10-ish years since we um, made this game, um, sometimes, you know, people will found that that um, they wanted uh, to build it with more sort of plot. They, they didn't want to do more prep, but they wanted a way to sort of have more continuity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're um, putting in in uh, this version is sort of getting some tools, of, uh, getting some like procedures and structures for kind of flagging characters like, oh, we like, you know, you you made up a character on the spot and we like that character. Um, so we're going to kind of give them some plot immunity, uh, a plot armor, um, mm-hmm. so you can't, uh, you know, kill them off. Uh, and then we're, and then we can call them back oh, um, in multiple scenes and, and sort of build uh, something around them. And when you say plot armor, so we don't kill them off, part of this is that if you're telling a story that takes place in a creepy, isolated town, you might have situations where right. something absolutely devastating happens. Right. And then, uh, you know, the radio announcer comes on and it's just like uh, a mysterious gas leak at the library ate everything but the bones from eight Correct. people today. Like, Correct. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. Like you could, you know, in the, in this kind of thing, uh, there are no hit points, right? Mm-hmm. So you could, you know, uh, could decide, you know, the person, you know, is the wrong place, wrong time. They get, you know, uh, eaten by an eldritch horror that confuses them for a bag of donuts. Yeah. Or, um, a, or the sign from the donut shop fell on them. You know, right, sometimes yeah. there's collateral damage. There's, but uh, yeah, yeah, it could just happen. Um, right. uh, yeah. Tra- tragic comic events are uh, always at the forefront. But then with this system, you can sort of say, oh, no, 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 we want to, and not that you can't, um, not that you can't uh, later take that character out, but like you're basically get to vote sort of and and flag that character as someone we want to see more of and build some stuff around and build several scenes around Mm -hmm. um, in the game. Well, that's cool. Um, And and so you mentioned you've been working on this for for over 10 years. this is actually the second edition of Community Radio that you're kickstarting, right. correct? Right. Yes, this is the second edition. Is you know, I, I built it and I haven't I haven't been straight working on it for ten years. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we it, we published the first edition. People played it, enjoyed it, um, and uh, but then you know, over ten years, you uh, you get feedback, you think about some stuff, um, and then you uh, you know decide. Okay, I have enough stuff. Um, for the game that I should uh, release it. And, you know, the first edition um, needed some things to give people more guidance. Um, there, there were people where places where people could get confused. Um, so I want to clarify there. There were like weird typos and uh, errors in it. You know, I want to put some editing in it. And um, 
and more importantly, most importantly for me, uh, I, I've been asked a bunch of times, like, when is it going to be in print? Um, and mm -hmm. I never had a good answer to that question until uh, now. So, Quinn, when is community radio going to be in print? <laughs> Um, it will be in print uh, shortly after the Kickstarter um, knows off. We're um, finalizing the editing um, and la last bits now. And um, uh, yeah, well, uh, we're uh, the Kickstarter campaign is running now and it closes March 8th. And yeah, we're looking at some, uh, you know, cool. I'll be announcing some cool uh, stretch goals. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really just looking forward to, to getting it set up oh that's so exciting and this is something where you uh you've been working on this for 10 years and you, you mentioned a whole list of things that you decided to like change or modify what have you worked on in the intervening 10 years can you tell us a little bit about some of your other projects like if if people enjoyed your work in this they might not e or in something else they might not even realize it was you you know mm -hmm. um, um i man i've uh worked on uh in the inter in interim, I've worked on a lot of things um, from uh, like larger systems to um, like indie kind of uh, games things. Um, I will highlight um, uh, in more recent times, uh, some of the more recent stuff you can find me in is in um, uh, Paizo stuff. So uh, Pathfinder and Starfinder. Um, I am the author of the um, adventures uh, spoken on the song Wind. Uh, which is part of the Strength of Thousands uh, adventure path. Uh, and then I am uh, the author of Clockwork Demons, which is the second book in the um, Drift Hackers book for Starfinder. Um, but then I've also uh, done um, lots of uh, different adventures for Pathfinder and Starfinder Society. Um, I've made uh, monsters. Last time we were, I was on here, we were talking about the Sombreva that I did for Bestiary 3. Um, so uh, in the last few years, I've done a lot of work uh, with Paizo. I, I really enjoy Pathfinder and Starfinder a lot working with. Um, for some of my own material, mm -hmm. um, some of the games uh, that have been like in and out, um, we, uh, a long time ago, you talked about Underworld um, on oh, here. Yeah. Um, I, did, I did that. Um, and then, um, I also have a game called uh, Five Fires. Um, that one's gone in and out. Uh, that one I actually have been working on for 10, like actively working on for 10 years here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, you know, been trying to perfect it, but I, I, I have uh, re-released it uh, and uh, will be uh, later in the year um, working on a full edition of it, like a full release um, of Five Fires, uh, which is a hip hop, uh, like old school hip hop RPG. That's cool. So in terms of your approach to game design, it sounds like you've got a very experienced and practiced oh. approach. Can you talk a little bit, though? Let's roll back the clock. How, how did you get started designing games? What were like some of your earliest projects? Um, so like I'm going to go I'm going to go briefly way back and Do it. then uh, we'll, 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 we'll time skip to, to uh, more relevant uh, back. Oh, I love time um, skips. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, when I was 11, I, uh, my brother, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, when I was actually younger than 11, uh, when I was like six or seven, um, I saw my brother and his friends playing the games and uh, playing D&D, &D, uh, first edition advanced Dungeons and Dragons, to be precise. Um, and uh, I wanted to play, uh, but they were like, nope, you can't play. And uh, so, of course, uh, once my brother got older and went to college and uh, was busy doing other things, I inherited his book at 11 and uh, started playing, except, uh, and here's the design relevant thing. Mm -hmm. He only had the player's handbook. And he had the player's handbook and the monster manuals. He had like almost everything except the dungeon master's guide. Oh, and um, so back in those days, like you basically needed the dungeon master's guide to play the game. It had the rules for experience points and leveling up, uh, like like how you assign them. It had all the magic items, all the stuff that they refer in there was like you needed it. And so I had to actually reverse engineer a lot of the game to play it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't get a Dungeon Master's Guide till like, I don't know, uh, four or five years after I started playing. Um, and then I got to see how much stuff I was got 
wrong, but then a surprising amount of stuff I got right. I was able to get from inference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I, I look at that reverse engineering thing of the, the thing that sort of uh, to, in order to play this thing, I was really interested in. I had to engage that design element um, to even do it. Uh, really so cool. then, so then fast forward. So I've always been, um, you know, it's led to me sort of having this theme that the rules are always uh, of a role playing game are always accessible to me. And I can always sort of think about them and do my own thing because that's, that's literally how I started doing it. Um, and uh, so uh, fast forward um, and I really got my start um, uh, with, fourth edition um D, &D. um i w w was uh i i got it i was really interested in it um uh so interested i started a blog um about it and i just uh, uh and that blog was a uh full a thing full of like uh different like homebrew rules and different content that i made up mm -hmm. um to play it with uh it was called uh at will um named after uh, the sort of at will pow powers that you would get in the game. Sure. And um, then from that, I actually got um, people like the homebrew stuff that I was doing on there enough that they, um, I got a couple of like offers to do some writing. Uh, my first published piece was um, in uh, Cobalt Press uh, or Cobalt Quarterly. Um, which was really cool. Um, and then um, I was part of their uh, Lost City Adventure project. Um, and that was like my first big assignment that was like a 12,000 word assignment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just from there, uh, you know, and, and I've had, uh, you know, uh, my struggles and, you know, been away from it for a while and other stuff, but it's just one of those things that is um, at this point uh, just, um, in my blood, in my heart. Um, and so I just not, you know, uh, I've, I've quit quitting and I just do it now. I've quit I quitting. It. I love that. Uh, <laughs> so so 12,000 words, that sounds intimidating, but how big were your blog posts at that time? Was that like I mean, the same size? Oh, I'm, I'm writing that every day? Or was that like, oh, wow, that's 12, 000, I mean, that's 12 I was, times I was as big? I was a much more inconsistent writer mm -hmm. then, um, you know, and so I would maybe make a blog post and that would be like, you know, a thousand, two thousand words. Um, and it's, the, the thing is, it's like you could, uh, wh what I found was, uh, and still find in larger projects is um, when you reach over about five, six thousand words, there is this weird, um, it takes on a different sort of scale of like coherence, right? You're trying mm -hmm. to write these things like, like it's easy to make something um, with a few thousand words that's uh, there and co coherent and uh, sort of holds together well. Uh, but once you start breaking that bigger barrier, you start, you can't hold the whole head in your whole project in your head. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have structure um, for how you're writing it, it, it quickly becomes uh, hard to even like conceive of and work on. Um, I, 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 that's what I found with my first big project there. It was just very hard to <laughs> hold in head because I didn't have structure. Like like now when I work on a project, I I outline it. I I have like these tools that I use to manage the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did not have that then. So it was a uh, I got it done. It was cool, but it was it was really hard. So managing complexity is is a big challenge for a lot of people. It, what advice would you have for somebody who's like, oh, okay, I've dabbled in writing games, but like, I really want to do that next big project. How, how would you recommend they kind of maybe approach breaking things up or, or, you know, managing that complexity? If you want to manage complexity, uh, like I said, you need structure. Um, and a really good way to find that structure is to go look at other stuff that you like, right? Mm -hmm. Like go, go, uh, there's nothing wrong um, with looking at, like, say, your favorite D and D book or favorite role playing book, and seeing how they structure things, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, you like them, so um, you you probably like their structure, and then say, okay, they are working on, you know, they have a section on combat, a section on spells, etc. And just for starters, start there, kind of break it out um, into those sections, and then 
from there break each of those sections down into you know other pieces you know and just work a bit at a time don't try to once you have your basic idea don't try to work on the whole idea uh that that will get you lost very fast uh just break take those sections and then uh keep sort of breaking them down and then just working on those bits and then and then you find uh, i always find when i uh writing a book so so in contrast to my first big project was twelve thousand. Mm -hmm. uh my first uh adventure for uh my first full book adventure for pathfinder was twenty eight thousand. oh wow um yeah <laughs> you know it's a big it was a big jump when you say they hired you to work on a twenty eight thousand word book project that's a twenty eight thousand word book that the the project is a whole book. They didn't just say, "Hey, we want you to come up with some monsters or write a chapter here or there." Like right. this is your book, right? Um, you know, there are parts of the book that I didn't write. Like they, uh, in the adventure books, they have like uh, usually have um, supporting material, like some background on the area or mm -hmm. um, you know different magic items that other people write. But but sure. yes, the rest of the rest of the book. Um, uh, uh, and the main sort of uh, bits of it were, were me. So the parts that other people wrote on a book on a book like that, where you're basically the lead, um, did you have some editorial review and control over what other people worked on, or was that something that the publisher no. handled? The the, uh, the the they the developers at Paizo handled that. Gotcha. So they so so like a lot of what their role is that they assign these things to people. They they um, break it out, and then they're like, we need these elements, and then they. Um, sort of uh, as you, as everybody writes, they do the work to bring those things together and make them mesh. Gotcha. That's really cool. And and so like working as part of teams like that, how many people would you say you've probably worked with over the course of your career? Just a ballpark. Probably a few dozen. Yeah. And that's, you know, and, and one thing about working with people is every person has their own distinct personality. They have their different approaches. Mm -hmm. Even when you try to standardize processes, people mm -hmm. are going to interpret the processes differently. Um, so when you started working on community radio, how did that inform when you're starting to hire up for the second edition? I saw you had quite a few people working with you on this. You had uh, mm -hmm. at least three or four um, there mm -hmm. in the uh, credits. How how did your previous experiences working with people inform how you selected the people to work with on this? The perfect tabletop kind of working experience for me is working with people who are um, professional um, yet sort of uh, friendly and sort of uh, basically like compassionate um, mm -hmm. on there. I don't, um, you know, you can do a thing that's all business and that's fine and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and uh but so, you know sometimes it can just be a bit cold and it, it doesn't it, it for me i don't find it stimulates sort of my creativity mm -hmm. um but then you know uh but on, on the other side you know it's great to be sort of friendly and stuff but if we're not communicating uh professionally or um sort of keeping to timelines or or uh things like that 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 can also get frustrating mm -hmm. so like finding that good mix um, which is, you know, it's one of the reasons I'll, I'll be honest I, that I really like working with uh, Paizo. I find that mix. Um, I really love working with the team uh, there, and mm -hmm. um, they're uh, professionals. Some of the, some of the best. They're they're awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted that for this team. Uh, I had uh, worked with uh, our graphic designer uh, Nathan Paletta, um, who uh, is also a designer. He did uh, the worldwide wrestling role playing game, uh, among others. Um, and so we worked on the first one. So he was an easy pick uh, to, you know, go with for the second edition. Uh, and then uh, my other, uh, the other writers and editor are people that I've known uh, for a long time. Um, I trust uh, their vision um, and I know they sort of can get things done. I've worked with uh, most of them on other projects, um, played games with them. So uh it was just very easy to uh, pick these people that I, I knew and I uh, could speak with. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty simple the, uh, for this one. That makes I didn't sense. have to go far. So it sounds like you really benefit from working with the same people repeatedly, like people who prove themselves to be reliable are going to be the sort of people that you're going to want to work with again, that sort of thing. Yeah. Re reliable, creative, um, 
you know, uh, people, you know, and, and, and also who, uh, not just those things, but people who are on a similar vibe, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, this game is not something like a, you know, a grim dark thing like Mork Borg, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't, I don't need, I don't need to bring that vibe to this project. You know, and nothing wrong with uh, Mark Borg is really cool, uh, okay. but you know, it's a different project. But, to be clear, there's, I, I can't like when I hear Mork Borg. I think both the Borg from Star Trek The Next Generation, which are supposed <laughs> to be terrifying and colossally, like, disproportionately powerful, but I also think of Mork from Orc as portrayed by Robin Williams with the amazing rainbow <laughs> suspenders. And so now I'm thinking of Star Trek The Next Generation Borg with the laser eyes and the rainbow suspenders, and I'm just like, I, I kind of want to play Mork Borg now. <laughs> that, that sounds fun. <laughs> We, we've, we've got a bunch of we've got a bunch of boards going nanu nanu. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, th this is part of part of it too, I guess. Is like it's just fun to riff with certain types of people. If they're creative, you'll, you'll be on the right. same page, and and you can make stuff work. Mm. Yeah, and you don't want people who are too much like you, right? Like like you want people who bring their own thing, uh, and. Uh, that it's more that you're not on the same vibe is that you appreciate each other's vibes, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I like your aesthetic, even though it's not mine. Um, and you like mine. And so let's like do something and like merge those. Yeah. And I would imagine having complementary approaches to things like deadlines and communication is important, right. but you want differences in kind of creative background and skill Correct. set. Right. So that, that's cool. And I, it sounds like, you got picked up initially because of your blog and things like that. Um, would you say that most of the people you work with also had something similar where even if it wasn't a blog, they had started off by self-publishing. They didn't necessarily go to school to become game designers. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know any people who go to school to be tabletop game designers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's not really a thing. <laughs> it's, it's very hard for it. It's very difficult for it to be lucrative. Yeah. Um, you know, so, some people make it so, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, so, um, you know, just about everybody is, um, you know, self-trained in some way, or they're coming from some other background. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about tabletop game design is that it's accessible. It requires little equipment. Um, or like, you know, sort of formal training. Uh, oh, yeah, I was surprised. To I was like, I was really curious, like, huh, what, what are like the folks at uh, Wizards of the Coast work in when they're writing their games? Hmm. And the answer is Microsoft Word. Yeah. I, I was just like, really? You don't use some sort of like custom mm -hmm. in-house word processing solution? You don't have no. your own specific thing? No, nah, we just all use Word. It's like... Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Huh. Yeah. Like, most people have access to something like that, even if it's just through your local library. You know, you can go in there, mm -hmm. work on a file, email it to yourself when you're done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, wow. These are these are tools that really anybody can, can get access to. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of making a game fun, though, that sounds like something, you know, that is... a a bit more of a challenge because you have to not only have your own idea of what's fun, but you have to be able to empathize with other people mm -hmm. and, and try to imagine what they would think is fun. Correct. Is there anything that you do to kind of get inside the heads of different types of players when you're designing a game? Yeah. I mean, so often, uh, when when I'm when I'm designing in design space, uh, I kind of uh, it, it can take me a long time to um, actually like write uh, or sort of develop a mechanic um, mm -hmm. because often what I'm doing is uh, like I, I try and run it through. Uh, I've been playing for thirty years, um, so I kind of run it through like not only sort of like filter stuff I've played, uh, but like people I've played with. And so I like, I try it out in these different situations um, and try and envision the sort of uh, experience of 
play, right? Uh, that that we, we think of RPG book and we think of books and rules and mechanic, but what uh, really role playing games are is our experiences. Mm -hmm. And so to imagine um, your experience and, like you said, like the empathy of um, which is to me just a, a form of social imagination, sure. right? It's sort of so, so to imagine how others might sort of take it, you know, how um, how a really uh, creative and freeform person might look at this mechanic, and also uh, a very sort of like structured and a literal thinker might look at it and, um, you know, think of who you're making the game for. And, you know, so like all of these things sort of, I, I just play around in that space for a long time. And then usually at some point it hits me like, oh, this is the way to express rules such that people can have this experience. And then, and then, and then you know, at some point you have to play test it and see how close you were or weren't to uh, with your guess, like your first draft of a, of almost any mechanic is a guess, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that and that's I think one of the most important uh, themes of of game design is like make sure that um, especially when you're starting, um, you're play testing uh, a lot, um, and uh, so so because you're gonna when you get more experience, you can get away with play testing less though you do really want to play test. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're starting out, you're, you're going to be guessing, you're always guessing, um, but you're going to guess wrong a lot more than when um, you get experience. And so for folks that are like trying to find play testers, um, you know, I, I would imagine there's local conventions, there's online groups, things mm -hmm. like that, um, that they would be able to just try out. But w what do you do at this point in your career when you're trying to play test something? How do you get a, a table together? What, what does that look um, like for you? Uh, I, I usually, uh, you know, I have a Discord um, with uh, a lot of like uh, friends and uh, game designers and players on there. So usually I just pester them. Uh, uh, depending on the game, I might pester my partner, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, or, you know, uh, just, just put it, put a call out on like social media sometimes like, Hey, I need somebody to play test, um, you know, this and, um, you know what, right now what I'm working on, cause I have, uh, so many, uh, games in the hopper, uh, mm -hmm. right now that I'm just developing in different stages of developing is trying to, um, get some regular time each week. Uh, like get sort of almost like a play test group of other designer friends um, so we can just, you know, uh, get together and just play test out, not even full games, but like I want to see how this mechanic plays out, uh, that, that kind of stuff, like just unfinished bits and workshop it. Well, that's cool. Quinn, can you tell us how much you need to fundraise on Kickstarter for community radio and how close you are to hitting your goal? Oh, we're funded. Woo! Um, right now we're, we're right now we're in overtime, and you know most of that stuff is uh, going to uh, you know we'll be announcing uh, some new stretch goals and stuff, but that'll be mostly going to um, art, um, a little extra content. Um, we're we're not going to try and uh, uh, blow this out and have you know um, you know add twenty new pages um, to sure. it so we can get this to backers as soon as possible, um, and then. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, uh, as, uh, we're doing this now, I think we're on like 140% funded, uh, but we're looking to, uh, get more people out there and playing and, uh, connecting with the game. So, uh, you can still back it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, this, uh, project is still going to be live, you said, until March 8th, I believe? Yes. And then for anybody who maybe is watching this video years from now, uh, we, we can't promise that this will be available at a particular website or anything, but do you have plans in general to have the book available as a PDF or something in the long term for people who might have missed the Kickstarter by three years and be watching this in 2027? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Indie Press Revolution uh, will be doing crowdfunding fulfillment, but we will also be making the book available through them. So you'll be able to buy them. Um, they show up at lots of cons. Um, they uh, will um, send stuff to retailers um, you know, they're a distributor um, as well. So, um, you know, uh, we're, we're still getting our site up uh, right now. Um, so, um, and we'll probably make it available through there as well. But um, definitely uh, Indie Press Revolution will have it. Well, that, that's exciting. So 
this is not a Kickstarter where you're trying to print precisely as many books as you sell through the Kickstarter. This is you're trying to do a, a larger print run. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're doing a, a larger print run and then, um, you know, uh, using that to also uh, get going on some other projects, too. So, oh, that's yeah, exciting. If, if we do well. So can you say anything about those other projects at this time? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I mentioned uh, Five Fires, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a hip hop role playing game. Um, that one I've been working on and off on for uh, 10 years. Um, you know, it's been a, a, this labor of love that I've, I've gone on with. It's, it's a really fun, awesome game. Um, and uh, we'll be working on that. That will be our next uh, project. Um, we're not going to we're not going to fully move on that until we uh, get people uh, fulfilled and, um, you know, uh, happy with uh, community radio. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is next in the hopper. Well, that makes sense. Cause, um, like for example, with our, our latest hermit craft charity event, uh, we, we did something, uh, over a year ago and people are like, Oh, that was amazing. Are you going to do another one this year at the same time? And it's like, well, the charity that's manufacturing these like video gaming carts that are going in hospitals, uh, is only sending them to Europe now. And we don't feel comfortable like coming back and asking for more money for, you know, a charity right. thing until we've completely closed out like, hey, all of that money from the first one has gone mm -hmm. to the place that makes the carts and now the carts are in the hospitals, you know? Yeah. So Yeah, even if even if people are fine with it and happy with it, it's like it's still it feels better to close those loops. Mm -hmm. um, before you open a loop, because you also don't know if they're still in the process of fulfilling that, uh, if there's some other hiccup, right? And then if there's things that you have to address, but while you're still trying to spin up another project, the, the complexity of compli like two complicated projects that you have to manage is like a, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and you sort of, like, like for me, I try and keep those streams like very separated for that reason. So people shouldn't expect to see Five Fires until after this one ships. When are you hoping to have this one? Uh, like, just once again, I'm not asking you to commit to a particular date, but like, sure. like a quarter of a particular year. Like, what uh, what quarter sure. are you um, hoping to have these out to people? On the Kickstarter, we say October. Um, it's mostly to cover for like any sort of shipping or like weird errors uh, there. But like, we're hoping really to have it, um, you know, be shipping stuff out to people by, uh, you know. Uh, June, at the latest. Well, that'd be is, fantastic. Is yeah, um, you know, uh, again, you know, we're, we're we we gave ourselves a lot of time because you know uh, things are are weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you I... know, and, and you don't have control over that. But we're the game is mostly done. Um, you know, uh, we're we'll just have some uh, art and layout and some um, further editing and stuff to do. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we're, we'll probably get most of the text and editing out during the campaign. And then it's just, um, the follow-up and like finishing. Okay. Wow. So it'd be great if you could stay ahead of things on the shipping, um, you know, and, and kind of beat that October goal. But yeah, you obviously don't want to promise more than you can absolutely assert. Right. Uh, in, yeah. in terms of like getting a PDF to people though, that would be sooner, right? Yeah. Th th yeah. That'll definitely be sooner. Um, and, um, depending on uh, how it goes, you might be able to get sort of a, a rough PDF of, uh, you know, unlaid out PDF with the rules in it. And then uh, uh, so people can sort of play it beforehand and then, um, you know, get the final layout afterwards. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to play it. If people wanted to play the first version of Community Radio today, just to get a taste of it before they make a decision, uh, where can they find that? Uh, yeah, that's on itch.io. It's on uh, thoughtcrimegames.itch.io. Uh, and you'll see a few of our other games there. Uh, and uh, Community Radio is there, the first edition. Um, you can take a peek with that. It's uh, fun and playable in its current form, and it will just uh, get better for our second edition. I I'm excited to uh, give that a try sometime. Uh, thank you so much, Quinn, for joining me on the show, because I have just probably marked out about I've covered about three kilometers worth of ground in Minecraft. Yeah, this has been amazing to watch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I said, I'm putting a big community project in the center of this, and so it's great to have the opportunity to reach out and hear about how you're engaging with the community while I do it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This is fun. 
Yeah. And if people want to find you on social media, I know you're at twitter.com slash QH underscore Murphy. You mentioned mm-hmm. your uh, existing games are available at thoughtcrime.itch.io. Are there any other links that you'd want to plug? Um, uh, I will, uh, I have, uh, uh, a newsletter. If you uh, like hearing sort of my thoughts on games, um, I talk about them uh, every two weeks. Um, I try and keep the newsletters like between 500 and 750 words. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're like short biweekly things. Uh, it's called uh, Imagination is for Everyone. Uh, right now we are on Substack. We're in the middle of moving, but um, it's uh, thoughtcrimegames.substack.com. Um, and that is our newsletter. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Quinn, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll get off the phone. and I might do a little bit more of an outro to this episode, so folks, stick around. I am standing next to a very, very consequential set of locks. Look at these logs. Oh, I just want to hug them. Ah, I'm so excited. I might have my axe out, but we're not chopping these babies down. No, like all babies, axes should be kept at a safe distance away from them. Yes, very much so, because these logs represent the first marker of any actual structure in our build. I've gone out and I've marked a bunch of blocks along the border so the hermits don't accidentally stumble in here and like start messing with things before it's ready for them. But this is one of the corners of the future service building. And, you know, you might say, Joe, service building, that doesn't sound very exciting. Tell that to my inventory. Look at this. Look at this inventory. We need to have chests where we can store things. And where are those chests going to go? Are they going to go in the yard? No. This isn't that kind of building area. We're going to actually, you know, construct the service building that will house the storage that we're going to need to start working on everything else. I might not have time to get that whole building knocked out today since we spent so much time hanging out with Quinn, but it's a fantastic start. I'm super hype. Look at this beautiful little road here. We should be using this. What we really should be using is a horse, but I don't have a saddle yet. So I am in search of XP Crafted, who supposedly has an extra saddle and some horse armor that I can have. Let's see if we can find him. Now, XP is on the living team, so he's a little bit paranoid. He said to meet him in the water by Vintage Beef's house. Here's Vintage Beef's house. Let's see if we can find the water of which XP crafted so carefully spoke. There's a lake back there. That might be it. But there might be another water type thing on the other side here. Difference, though. Oh, here well, it is. That would have been in it longer. Can you stack, like, a bunch of lingering potions on top of each other? I've never Probably. actually tried. Those are expensive, Hello. though, because you need the dragon's breath. Hello, Mr. Of the Hills. Howdy. You You're hey, looking Joe. particularly jolly today. Uh-huh. I'm, 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 I'm looking good. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that you burned uh, Joel to death earlier. Congrats. Yeah, I shot him with an arrow. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, thank you so he much. Was in, he was invisible. So, oh, oh, that is very He sneaky. was invisible. Yep. Mm-hmm. Didn't he say that he was gonna like stop trying? Like, wasn't he trying yep. to make a deal with you and earlier? And then, and then he tries twice today. Hmm. Well, I mean, oh yeah, you mean after? Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, yeah that deal's off. Oh wow. <laughs> Any deal that would have been is no longer. Yeah, like, I... am I no longer part of the deal? I mean, I don't know. Are you gonna try to murder me again? Yes. Well, then no. <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. What's this deal? Because I've made a deal with B Dubs, but I haven't made a deal with False or you yet. No, uh, no. If you got a deal with B Dubs, you can't deal with me. Oh, you'd no. have to break the deal with him to deal with me. Oh, because see, I was thinking that I could make a deal with both of you and then go kill False, and that would be beneficial nope. to both of you. Oh, no. Nope. Okay. No, nope. no. Nope. If you're not with me, you're against me. Oh, well, <laughs> dang it. Unfortunately, I didn't really bring anything to kill you with. I've got two puffer fish, but I think they're both dead. So yeah, they look kind of oh, no. stiff. Yeah, they're not they're not doing the job. Uh, let's see. Oh, I did bring a bucket of lava. Maybe that'll no that no that did not that didn't work. E- oh no, that's no, it, it, oh, no. never getting that back. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's rip. gone. I think there's I think it's, there's a way down there now. right here. 
Oh, really? To get down there to... Yeah. I love I that... Wait a second. Did you build this bubble thing yourself here? Is no. this is this part of your Dave arena? Did. No. I didn't build it. There is a collection system down here. We could, like, put a whole bunch of stuff in there. <laughs> Just random stuff. Wait, what is yeah. this thing? Is this a, is this an item collector? Yeah. Like I said, there's a, it looks like there's a way down right here. So you didn't make this? No. Well, oh, I'm going to totally go die in this thing. No, it's not a way down. I oh. mean... Maybe you maybe sure? you have to destroy a block or something, but I don't want to you know break it if like it floods the redstone or something. Oh, there is the a block, block right there. Okay. Yeah. All I know is that I heard rails going or like, like a minecart going underneath that thing. So yeah, it's somebody's collection. I'm, I'm thinking it's for like fish slash squid. Oh, interesting. Like just kind of like a passive deal. Yeah, because I, I, I know. Fall in again. Yeah, I noticed that there seemed to be lips on it, so you're not going to be able to get back out without breaking blocks. So, mm. yeah, XB almost demised himself earlier when he fell down in there. <laughs> like, oh yeah, super close. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was. Yeah, I was down to like half a heart. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. I'm looking at what else I've got on me. If there's anything like I could kill somebody with besides a sword or an axe. I've got these berry bushes, but you're cleverly not standing on anything I can plant them on. So I'm just going to eat them instead. And, and that would take an exorbitantly amount, uh, you know, long time. Well, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, I could have some, oh no, that's, yeah, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was like, maybe I could have something distracting happen. I don't know, do you have any pets? <laughs> maybe I could leave a steak out and one of them knocks over a lamp. There could be a whole chain reaction of problems. Oh, Doc. Oh. A zombified piglin, huh? Hmm. You must be making a f another farm. Wait, Doc making a farm? No. I know, it's crazy talk, no. but it does happen from time to time. <laughs> he should take after How's beef. I, lo I love this natural wheat farm. This is... This is the chill way. I bet if he if he planted zombified piglins like this, they wouldn't be attacking him. They'd just be serene in the rolling hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know Beef got pranked recently with a bunch of poppies. Is there, like, some kind of crop that we could replace his wheat with that he might not appreciate but would be uh, Probably pretty much anything because he obviously wanted wheat here. Hmm. How about beetroots? What if we swap it all with, like, beetroots? I mean, how many that beetroot would... seeds do you have on you? Because I have a single um, beetroot and zero beetroot seeds. Well, you're you're doing much better than I am. Yeah, yeah, I have no beetroots. <laughs> I'm just trying to think, like, what's the worst crop that we could plant? We could mm. just bone meal an axe on it again. <laughs> I mean, I bet I bet if we replaced it with a bamboo grove, he would notice mm. that. What if we like change it all to like chorus fruit? Well, that'd be a lot of course fruit we need, and then we yeah. need um, <laughs> endstone. Endstone, yeah, that's a multi-step. I mean, obviously, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, but that's a that's a lot of overdoing for one morning. Yeah, that really would be. Maybe, maybe another time. I'm not feeling it right now. <laughs> yeah. He's been pranked like three times already. That's true. So. It's, 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 it's like, so just central. let me be. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you put your house out in the open like this, mm -hmm. you should expect it. It's it's right in the path to go anywhere, so. Mm -hmm. It is a good location, though. Mm-hmm. What is that nether portal? Like, what is going on? I think it's like three nether portals. It's very modern. It's... I like it. Abstract. Yeah, it it, it kind of makes you think. It makes you think, was somebody drunk? It makes you think, who would build another portal like that? <laughs> I mean, like, but now that I've seen it, and I've seen how sus. people respond to it, I kind of want to make all the nether portals like that. Wait, is it supposed to be a cactus? Are those, like, cactus arms? Is that a, is that a bumbo portal? Yeah, is this, is this an Iskul cactus portal, maybe? I don't know, it's looking a little sus to me. Oh, Very especially sus. with the sun going down, it actually looks like the visor. Oh, wait, that's not the sun going down. That's the um, the uh, spyglass lens flare. <laughs> so you guys could not see that at all. Never mind. Nope.
<laughs> I mean, there was a sun behind it, but somebody slept. So yeah. All right. I think I'm going to try and get back to building now. All righty. Yeah. Hopefully nobody's going to try to murder me again. I mean, that lava yeah. bucket was actually my best shot, and it is completely took on. So, <laughs> all right. I mean, it, there's it's, there's a collection system. There's got to be oh, something. I, I, right? I was going to say, yeah, well, I mean, if you want to try. What did, what did, what did, what did uh, I was just trying, you know, trying to enclose you. It's fine <laughs> in the water. <laughs> I had to try something. <laughs> I offered you copper earlier. I figured I should give it to you. You know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where that. There's got to be a collection for it somewhere. Yeah, I just don't want to risk breaking it. But uh, do you actually need copper or blue ice or berries? Because oh no, I've got. Yeah, I've got all that. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm good, man. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much for the saddle and the horse armor, because like, yeah, yeah, no worries. They're uh, a huge boon for me at this stage in the game. I wasn't using them, so. Okay, if we can convince this donkey we're good people, yay! Okay, so now we can put a saddle on. Oh, this is actually a pretty fast donkey. Oh, this is great. So I guess the question is how far that way do we have to go to get to a bridge okay, that right there looks like it's maybe a good spot very traversable we don't want to spend a lot of copper on this bridge there we go the perfect bridge actually hold on hold on gonna make it perfect i can't see to make it perfect there it is the perfect bridge in minecraft 1.20.4 completely copper construction a brilliant compliment to the landscape i am just loving how much i'm getting built this season i'm really glad xp was able to get us this saddle because I have a bunch of stuff over here I wanted to show y'all. After my interview with Quinn Murphy, I started laying out where some of the roads were going to be here. And marking them with blue ice, which I got by packing the ice from the ice uh, spikes here. I stopped by Doc's little farm and got a Silk Touch pickaxe. That's been really getting me a lot of, uh, a lot of work done. I was curious... Can horses and donkeys use ice roads? So there's definitely some sliding. I was curious if you could do any weird jumping and speeding up glitches, but it seems like no. But yeah, this might be a little bit narrow for people to use boats on, because the boats go pretty darn fast. Like, if I go over here... And I get on this boat. Let me show you. So let's say I'm trying to stay. Uh, say I'm trying to stay inside the lines here. Actually, I'm doing okay at that. Probably because I've been practicing. Ow. But I'm not sure that that's the uh, best option for people. I don't know. But if it. I wanted to make sure before I went all in on the ice, though, that the roads would work for horses and donkeys and stuff. And it seems like they do. So as long as horses and donkeys can use these roads, that should be fine. Now, I was curious, do they run faster on blue ice the way boats go faster on blue ice? It doesn't really seem like it. Okay. Because what I'm thinking for right now is I'm just going to use blue ice to mark the outlines of the roads. I've been kind of putting in some dots, and then I'll connect the dots. And then I wanted to light this up. So I realized in order to have light that's not going to melt the ice, I'm probably going to need to replace the interior of the roads with packed ice. So we, we I think that'd be okay, though, because we got a lot of packed ice around here that we're looking at renovating or terraforming out anyway. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Yeah, okay. This is, this is going to work. I'm going to go grab another horse or two so we can really get going. Time skip. They're not a... 
This is kind of a bridge. This is the worst bridge ever. Impulse is muted, so he can't hear me hating his bridge. Howdy, Skiz! Hey, what's up, buddy? Not much. I was, I was, you know, thinking maybe I should come by and bring you something, so I got some medicinal berries here. And <laughs> also some golden carrots. I'm sure that whatever your physician suggested is going to be better, but, you know, uh, there's a little bit less to stress about. There you go. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. All right. I would uh, I would sit there. I got a couple cats waiting for uh to, for a recording, so I got to go head out. But thank you, man. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't let me hold you up. The sun may be setting on the Hermitcraft server for today, but when I look out at all of these little marks I see here, you know what I realize? It's that you know what this is going to be really difficult for people to visualize at this scale. I think next episode. We're going to go into the nether, and we're going to try and figure this out in a way that, like, other hermits can just, like, perceive. This is just a teeny tiny chunk of the whole, and it's just not, it's just not going to read. The hermits are visual people. So, off to the nether we go next episode. But before we do, I do need to mention that this episode was mid-roll ad-free. Thanks to M. Lavis. Thanks, M. Lavis. In lieu of that mid-roll ad, I will now read a haiku of my own devising. This seems too big now, but the nether is smaller by like seven-eighths. Until next time, y'all, this is Joe Hills from Nashville, Tennessee. Keep adventuring.